four of the five, quote, blue zones and uh, are uh, blue zones because they're sheep herders and their benefit of longevity comes from the fact that they. What are the top vegetables that people should add to their diet consistently to lose weight and fight off disease? The top vegetables. Top vegetables. Well, uh, technically, I guess it's not a vegetable, but mushrooms are so far up on my list of um, produce that people should really be getting into their diet as often as they can for for multiple reasons. But one of the fun ones, and I actually talk about this in the upcoming book, is a lot of people have heard about a uh, polysaccharide for people to, who don't know what polysaccharides are. Polysaccharides means lots of sugars. And before everybody freaks out that um, you and I are telling people to eat sugars, um, these polysaccharides are sugar molecules that are bound together with very tight chemical bonds. And these chemical bonds are very difficult for us, uh, our digestive enzymes, to break. But uh, bacteria think that they are some of the finest food that they could possibly eat. And so uh, there's increasing evidence that the polysaccharides in the diet are one of the keys to having uh, a really diverse uh, gut microbiome. And uh, these polysaccharides, in turn, are turned into what I've been writing the last few books about, what are called postbiotic compounds. Not prebiotic, not pro probiotic, but postbiotic. And these are compounds that bacteria make by eating prebiotics and, poly and polysaccharides that uh, benefit our brain, benefit our mitochondria, benefit uh, you, you name it, it benefits us. So back to polysaccharides. Mushrooms in general are loaded with uh, polysaccharides, one of which is beta-glucan. Now, lots of people have heard about beta-glucan because oats happen to have beta-glucan in them. But oats have a beta-glucan that actually isn't very usable to our gut microbiome. Hmm. And so uh, mushrooms <coughs> excuse me, have a branched beta-glucan, and oats have a single non-branched beta-glucan. And really cool studies, uh, particularly in rodents, but also in humans, show that the beta-glucans in mushrooms are what do all the good, and beta-glucans in uh, oats uh, are actually pretty useless. In fact, beta-glucans in oats make you gain weight. The beta-glucans in mushrooms make you lose weight. And these are studies. Um, I don't even have to do a study because my oldest daughter is a horsewoman and an Olympic, uh, an Olympic level athlete in dressage, and she assures me that the only purpose of oats is to fatten horses for winter. And uh, I've certainly found in my clinic that oats are a really good way to fatten humans for winter. So, uh, but so back to mushrooms. Mushrooms are so good for you. And the, the great thing is almost every grocery store now is getting lots and lots of different mushrooms. We used to have the humble button mushroom, the white mushroom, Almost all grocery stores have the brown mushrooms, the criminy. Tons of them now have portobello mushrooms, those great big ones that I've made portobello mushroom pizzas um, out of. Uh, sure, uh, shiitake mushrooms are becoming more common. And really cool, we see trumpet mushrooms, we see porcini mushrooms, we see lion's mane mushrooms. And you and I both know about lion's mane uh, because lion's mane actually contains uh, some compounds that will actually increase the production of BDNF, brain neurotropic factor. That actually grows neurons. And why wouldn't we want to grow neurons? Um, the idea that our number of neurons is fixed for life, uh, luckily, is not true. 
And uh, the more BDNF that we get in our diet, and lion's mane is a great way to do it, uh, the more neurons we potentially can grow. So mushrooms. Wow. So in a way, lion's mane mushroom in particular can help keep our brains young. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's it's really interesting. Again, these these polysaccharides, particularly in mushrooms, they they themselves aren't aren't the amazing part of mushrooms. It's what our gut microbiome does with these polysaccharides that are the amazing properties that these postbiotics and and BDNF is actually a postbiotic that was made by our gut microbiome from, for instance, lion's mane. In this hmm. I want to uh, ask uh, a little bit about because um, you mentioned oats and oatmeal, and I want to push back if I may, because a lot of people consider oatmeal to be a superfood. I mean, you, you go to the supermarket and you see the Red Heart Healthy logo on innumerable brand, you know, oatmeal options. Um, and, you know, truth be told, you go down any number of fitness rabbit holes on YouTube, you see plenty of bodybuilders making use of oatmeal yep. as, a, as, a, as a source of pre-workout carbohydrates. Yep. And seemingly these people are all in, in great shape from what you can yep. observe from, from the outside. So what is the gripe that you have against, against oats specifically? Well, oats, uh, boy, where do I start? First of all, oats have a protein that cross reacts with gluten. And so many of my patients who are gluten sensitive, uh, oats comes up on their sensitivities all the time. Same way with corn. Uh, 70% of my patients who are gluten sensitive uh, cross react with corn as if it was gluten. Hmm. So maybe that's number one. But probably more importantly, um, there have been now multiple reports from the Environmental Working Group, from our consumer reports, looking at the amount of Roundup glyphosate in oats. And almost all oats in America, even the organic ones, uh, are contaminated with glyphosate. Most, uh, well, I hope most people now know that uh, Roundup is not only used on GMO products, but Roundup is now routinely sprayed on almost all conventional grain crops uh, for the purpose of desiccation. And that means kill the crop, let it die, let it dry out, and then you can harvest it. And it turns out it's a whole lot easier to harvest grains when the plant is dead rather than when it's alive. And modern big agriculture has to have these million dollar harvesting machines on a field on a particular day and doesn't want to depend on the weather. So everything is sprayed with Roundup, including our oats. Now, in my new book, there's sadly a herbicide that is banned as carcinogenic in the United States that is used on oats to prevent the oat stalk from growing too high. If the oat stalk grows too high, it breaks when wind and that ruins your profits. So you can spray oats uh, with this uh, herbicide to diminish the height of growth of the stalk. And that way you can harvest it. Now, it's illegal. But um, during a former administration, the EPA relaxed the parts per million that this pest that herbicide could be detected. And uh, we now, with the Environmental Working Group, has found that all oats in the United States are loaded with this carcinogenic pesticide. And uh, on top of that, Quaker old fashioned oats is actually the highest. It's 400 times the legal limit for this pesticide. Uh, and nobody measures it because it's banned. And yet there it is being used. So if you want something that's really good for causing cancer, for causing microbiome disruption, we now know sadly that. Glyphosate is an antibiotic, and it really 
changes the uh, characteristics of our gut microbiome. In fact, the really bad thing about glyphosate is that it particularly kills off the microbiome that's responsible for turning tryptophan into serotonin. And uh, if you want a bad mood and if you want to be anxious, then have your healthy bowl of oatmeal. That's all I can say. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I have no no dog in this fight. I've never been a huge oatmeal fan, but I've I've enjoyed it occasionally throughout my life. So you're saying like even gluten-free oats, oats that are certified gluten-free and organic are probably something that you want to minimize in your diet. Yep. Uh in fact, even the consumer reports article showed that uh, a number of organic oats tested positive for glyphosate. So, and that's because um, of drift and this stuff is sprayed in the air and you may have an organic field, um, but the guy next to you doesn't and he's spraying glyphosate and it drifts. Um, I, I have a friend who's a California winemaker who is a biodynamic winemaker here in Santa Barbara County. And he's got one section uh, that he cannot label organic or biodynamic, even though he grows that way because the vineyards around this section spread mm. and it drifts. And so it drives him crazy, but he can't control it. So he can't label that vineyard organic. Interesting. Yeah. As much as we try to control nature, um, it really does end up being an exercise in, in hubris at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot, I mean, a lot of people eat oatmeal for, for breakfast, right? Because it's, it's satiating because it does have this fiber, whether or not it, it functions, you know, at, at peak capacity, the way that the, the, the beta glucans and mushrooms do, uh, to be determined. But so if people are, are swapping the oatmeal out for, for a, for a healthier alternative, what is the ideal way to start, uh, one's morning? Oh, well, the ideal way is to not have anything. Um, we did not crawl out of our caves long ago and say, what's for breakfast? Um, there was no breakfast. And we didn't eat breakfast until we found breakfast. And that might have been at lunchtime. It might have been at dinner. Or we might have gone days without eating breakfast or lunch or dinner. And that was our design. Uh, so uh, the longer we can go, um, before break fasting, uh, in general, the better. But I understand that people, uh, there's a cultural influence on breakfast. Uh, we, ha we forget that breakfast is actually a modern invention. It was invented basically during the Industrial Revolution when men uh, had to go into factories and they didn't have any breaks. They didn't have any lunch. They didn't have any 15 minute, you know, social breaks. And so their wives would make them breakfast before they left and they wouldn't get back until late at night. And they were actually doing a Ramadan diet, if you think about it, which is actually pretty good for you. Mm. Uh, so breakfast is, is really a modern concoction. Take that late 1800s and then invent Kellogg's cornflakes in the early 1900s. And you have a setup for breakfast is the most important meal of the day. In fact, interestingly enough, Kellogg's cornflakes were originally advertised as the first pre-digested food. Interesting. Yeah. And there was... Um, William and Harvey Kellogg felt that the digestive process was very sapping of energy. <laughs> and you should pre-digest your meal uh, and that would take away the work of digestion. So one of their major claims was that this was the first pre-digested meal. And of course, in a way, they were right, because if you wanted to spike your blood sugar, um, that's a really great way to do it. Predigest all your all your components. I mean, it's just a, it's just another way of saying processing it, right? Yeah, like it's, exactly. It's, it was it was the first processed food. Congratulations! Yeah. But but they're advertising it like it's like actually a health benefit, right? Right. <laughs> that's hilarious. And also, weren't the Kellogg brothers? They were like they were extremely extremely religious, and they were big advocates for abstinence. 
And there's well, they, were, they were Seventh Day Adventists. And, uh, you know, having been a professor at Loma Linda University for most of my career, uh, I, which is a Seventh Day Adventist uh, institution, uh, I, you know, got to know the Seventh Day Adventist culture. And uh, don't get me wrong, I've done many mission works for the Seventh Day Adventists. I'm not a Seventh Day Adventist, but um, they're interested in people's health. Uh, they're, that's one of their virtues. Uh, but uh, William and Harvey Kellogg uh, were convinced that, um, for instance, spices were uh, caused uh, men and women to have sexual desires <laughs> and that sexual desires was a very bad thing. Whereas whole grains were thought because they were so bland that bland foods would actually decrease uh, sexual desires. The problem was that at their uh, Battle Creek Sanitarium Health Clinic, they really couldn't get people to eat whole grains because, quite frankly, they didn't taste very good. Uh, so they came up with the idea of putting sugar in uh, macerated cornflakes. And that was the way to get them to eat these healthy whole grains. But the whole culture is fascinating. They, uh, for instance, pepper was not allowed because it was an aphrodisiac. And uh, yeah, so all sorts of interesting uh, cultural phenomenons in trying to stop these lustful appetites that, that they were trying to suppress. Probably a bit of uh, xenophobia in there, if you know what I'm saying, because it's like, you know, ethnic food is very spicy. And these like these these brothers, obviously, you know, from the West probably looked at all these cultures rapidly multiplying and were like, oh, we got to like, you know, we, we can't become them, which uh, is obviously a, a really inappropriate way to think about um, food and culture and reproduction. But like but, you know, back then it was like all bets are off. Well, you know, it's it's interesting you should mention that because um, one of the, quote, blue zones, uh, of course, is, is Loma Linda. And, but Okinawa is also one of the blue zones. And the Okinawans are interesting because um, they are actually called the spice eaters in Japan. Hmm. And the Okinawans... Um, their food is full of diverse spices, which is very unusual uh, in Japan in general. And but they were characterized as the spice eaters, uh, which is uh, when I again researching this new book, it was a it was an aspect of their early culture that I wasn't aware of because it really wasn't mentioned uh, in the talk about what makes the Okinawan diet a diet, but they were called the spice eaters in Japan. They were unique. Interesting. What kind of, what kinds of spices? So they, they, um, they have a, they're, they're a semi-tropical area in Japan. They, they, their wet season is so bad that they actually can't grow rice. And the only thing that could grow was a sweet potato that was brought over from China. Um, eons ago. And that was the purple sweet potato. It was about the only thing that would grow. Um, so they don't eat rice. Um, they don't eat tofu. They're 85% of their diet is a purple sweet potato, which is loaded with polyphenols. And if anybody's compared a regular sweet potato to these blue or purple sweet potatoes that we now see, these purple sweet potatoes are very dense and they're not fluffy like, you know, an orange or a yellow sweet potato or yam. And it was this density that made them very, very, very slow to digest. Uh, unlike, for instance, if you wanted to spike your blood sugar, get yourself an Idaho baking potato. Mm. And all these starch granules, of course, are exposed and easy to digest. So, you know, it was just, was it dumb luck that that's all they could grow? Maybe. Um, but yeah, it was the purple sweet potato. And they had all these bitter, spicy greens that were capable of growing in this climate. And so they would eat these bitter, spicy greens and these purple sweet potatoes. And that's basically what they ate. 
Fascinating. I've never been to Okinawa, but um, I think I've, I've heard that they actually eat quite a bit of pork over there. Yeah. No, well, pork is the only thing they can raise. Uh, they they do uh, use pork fat when they do eat meat. It is pork. But um, it, interesting, the original Okinawan diet uh, was um, written down by the U.S. military because Okinawan obviously was captured and became a military base. And so uh, the U.S. military in 1947 actually chronologized um, the uh, Okinawan diet, and it was 85 uh, percent sweet potatoes. And the hilarious thing is they didn't uh, they did use soy products, but it was miso and um, soy sauce, but they didn't use tofu. Uh, which is interesting. So you, you hear all these people saying, well, it's a blue zone and all they eat is rice and, and uh, soybeans. Uh, no, uh, actually, they don't. <laughs> so, oh Fascinating. Well. Fascinating. I want to talk more about because we've, we've already discussed oats uh, a bit. What are some yeah. other commonly consumed superfoods that people actually probably shouldn't eat too much of? Um, I, I'm going to. There's a there's a class of lectins that I did not mention in the plant paradox or any of my subsequent books, uh, probably because I didn't want to uh, cause more widespread panic than than that book and myself do on a daily basis. But there's a class of lectins that are called aquaporins, and uh, I'm. I talk about them in the upcoming book because I about 80% of my practice now is people with autoimmune diseases that have resisted conventional therapy or for people who really don't want to take immunosuppressive drugs for the rest of their life. And these are the people who kind of end up in my practice now. So we started, uh, doing leaky gut tests a, a number of years ago. And we started looking at uh, foods that people had sensitivities to. Now, years ago, when I first started doing this over 20 years ago, we would do food allergy testing. And we'd put like 100 needle pricks on somebody's back with all these different foods. And if it got red, um, you had a food allergy. And it was based on a type of immunoglobulin called IgE. Um, unfortunately, that has very little to do with anything in terms of food sensitivities. And briefly, if you have a leaky gut and the every human being with an autoimmune disease that I've measured has a leaky gut. So if you have spaces in the wall of your gut and the wall of your gut is only one cell thick, if you have gaps, then undigested food particles would and do get through the wall of your gut and they are identified by your immune system as foreign. Now, I'll just use an example. Uh, and I'm not picking on broccoli, but let's suppose you have leaky gut and you're eating a lot of broccoli and we do a food sensitivity test on you and broccoli shows up as a food you're sensitive to. And you go, what the heck? You know, broccoli is a superfood. I eat broccoli all the time. I love broccoli. And we go, well, yeah, but you have leaky gut and all that broccoli is not broken down completely. so. Little pieces of broccoli are getting past the wall of your gut and your immune system says, wait a minute, I have never seen a piece of broccoli before in my life. Uh, I've seen the components of broccoli. I've seen sugars. I've seen proteins. Um, I've seen a little bit of fat, fat from broccoli, but I've never seen broccoli. That's foreign. And I'm going to make an antibody to it, an IgG antibody. Just like if, heaven forbid, you get a shot, um, you make an IgG antibody to something. Or 
you uh, you you catch a cold, you make an IgG antibody to it for a little while. So when companies started saying, son of a gun, we should do IgG testing on people with various foods and see what they react to. So getting back to aquaporins, um, there are plants uh, breathe through their leaves, and then they have pores in their leaves, and they move water vapor through these pores, and they move carbon dioxide in through the pores, and they pop oxygen out through these pores. And the opening of these pores are controlled by a protein that's called an aquaporin. Mm. Aqua, water, pore. It turns out that plants move water from their roots up their stems via osmosis, a gradient, and you have to move against gravity. So there are locks in a canal that open and close as water moves up and the lock closes, and those are controlled by aquaporins. It turns out the humans have aquaporins in the wall of our gut. That's actually how water can, you can get massive diarrhea, opening up aquaporins. We have aquaporins in our blood-brain barrier. Hmm. And we have aquaporins in our myelin sheath. So the aquaporins in humans look remarkably similar to the aquaporins in certain plants. And those plants uh, happen to be the nightshade family. So there is an aquaporin in tobacco, which is a nightshade. There's an aquaporin in peppers. There's an aquaporin in eggplant. There's an aquaporin in corn, it turns out. There's an aquaporin in tomatoes. Um, and so, and there's an aquaporin in soybeans. So if you develop a, and last but not least, I'm leaving it out because I hate to bring it up. Spinach has an aquaporin. Mm -hmm. And early on, uh, I see a lot of people, particularly women with, uh, MS, multiple sclerosis. And these are remarkably healthy eaters. And so we started early on looking at aquaporins in people. And lo and behold, a number of my patients with uh, MS uh, reacted to the aquaporin in spinach, the aquaporin lectin. And when we took spinach away from these individuals, uh, they clearly uh, improved. Uh, we see people who react to the aquaporin in tomatoes. We see them react to the aquaporin in peppers. Sadly, uh, we and in corn, uh, we I haven't found a paper yet that suggests that pressure cooking would destroy the aquaporins in these foods. Uh, pressure cooking clearly destroys lectins, um, but. There's not a paper that I can find that shows pressure cooking destroys aquaporins. So long story short, uh, most people can eat spinach. But when I've got a person with an autoimmune disease that we don't test or doesn't have the money, uh, one of the things I suggest that they take out of their diet is spinach. And it's not for the oxalates. Uh, it's for the aquaporins and spinach. And that... Okay, so that'll go out over the airways and go, oh, and, you know, Dr. Gundry says you can't have spinach. Um, also, uh, we see a lot of people with interstitial cystitis that spinach is a big culprit. Um, we recently identified it in a, in a very famous uh, male actor, and spinach was his culprit. And it's, it has nothing to do with the oxalates. It's these aqua, no. it's it's these aquaporins. So ex exogenously consumed aquaporins, like when we consume them in food. Yeah. What do they do? They they stimulate the opening of of the aquaporins in us. Like how does it no. work? So they they are they are slightly different um, molecular 
construction, but they're very close to ours. But because they're slightly different, and, and we can get into new 5GC and new 5AC if you want, but because they're slightly different, we susceptible individuals can make an antibody to the aquaporins in these foods. And that antibody then sees our aquaporins mm. in the wall of our gut, in the blood brain barrier, or particularly in the myelin sheath, and attacks those aquaporins as foreign. Uh, it's called molecular mimicry. And it's actually the basis of, of most of our, I think, current understanding of how autoimmune disease is not necessarily an autoimmune disease, but it's a it's a molecular mimicry of one target looking a lot like another. I was just giving an example. I was at the uh, major microbiome meeting in Paris last fall, and fascinating paper looking at the uh, microbiome of kids uh, who develop type one diabetes. And there's a species of bacteria uh, in these kids that makes a insulin-like molecule. It looks a lot like insulin, but it's not quite. And it's made by these bacteria. And lo and behold, these kids, their immune system, go looking for this molecule. And it looks a lot like insulin. So the immune system attacks the beta cell of the pancreas because that's where this molecule appears to be coming from. And this paper was fascinating because kids who didn't have that bacteria didn't have an attack on their uh, pancreas. And it was this bacteria making this insulin-like compound that prompted the attack on the pancreas. Molecular mimicry. So it's basically like a form of collateral damage, right? Like your immune system goes looking for these foreign particles yeah. and, and, and there ends up being this misfiring where it mistakenly will start to attack host tissues. We, we've, t we've talked about this quite a bit in the, on the show in the past with regard to gluten and how a lot of people with autoimmune thyroid conditions seem to see a reprieve from their symptomology when they cut gluten out of their diets. Yeah, the, you know, the whole idea of molecular mimicry was uh, actually started way back uh, with, you know, the father of the, of the paleo diet. And it's gotten more, more precise as time goes on with, you know, how this mechanism works. But it, 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 it's a lot of mistaken identity. Um, if, if we're at war and we're um, looking and we've got a, we've got a poster um, saying, you know, look for this guy, you know, he, he's public enemy number one, and this is what he looks like. And maybe he's got a, a hood and he's got dark glasses. And, you know, all of a sudden there's a guy walking down the street in a hood and dark glasses. And you're going, oh my gosh, you know, that, that mess measures the description. It's not exactly the same, but geez, you know, I, I better, you know, shoot this guy. Better safe than sorry. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I may get an award, but, you know, that's and so we think that that's actually how the immune system uh, responds. Now, the important part of that, which I think we forget, is that normally a normally function immune system is is educated by the microbiome as to what the immune system should be interested in what the microbiome says, hey, we got this. You don't have to worry about these guys. Um, but now uh, our microbiome is, is, a, is a wasteland. We've killed off our microbiome. We've killed off the microbiome teaching our immune system what it ought to be worried about and compound that now with Almost everybody that I see has leaky gut. So all the time we've got foreign molecules coming across our gut. And so our immune system, rather than being a, a, 
a cop in in London walking the streets with a billy club. Now uh, our immune system has got two AK-47s and two bandoliers of magazine rounds. And the the finger is literally on the trigger. And so when it sees anything that even remotely looks like what they're after, you know, shoot first and ask questions later. And that's part of the problem. So how do we heal the microbiome? And, and fix this epidemic of, of leaky gut, intestinal permeability that we are seemingly seeing quite a bit of these days. That's, um, uh, that's the book, uh, <laughs> the next book. It's, it's harder than people think to um, repair the microbiome. Uh, when I first started doing this over 20 years, I was pretty naive and thought that you could probably see a leaky gut in a couple of weeks, most people in my practice who are diligent in you know eliminating foods um, that we find our problem can take nine months to a year to seal their leaky gut. And the exciting thing is, and I published a couple of papers about this, uh, ninety to ninety four percent of people, um, within nine to nine months to a year will seal their leaky gut. Not bad. And the fascinating thing is that we can measure that these vaccinations against gluten or against corn or against dairy or spinach uh, result. Your immune system can actually be retrained to not see these compounds as uh, as foreign anymore and not get their panties in a lot, which is really exciting. Super exciting. And it's, it's the carrot on the stick that I, I hold out for my patients when a lot of times we have to take away some of their favorite foods. And... Um, they're not particularly happy about that, but they wouldn't be in my office if they were happy with their life. Mm. And so the good news is that we can actually show them like every three months how we're doing with repairing their leaky gut and how we're doing with retraining their immune system. And it's, I mean, it's just fascinating. I just had a patient in the office yesterday who, um, I'll just use an, an example. We, so when we look for leaky gut, um, we use a test that's called the Wheat Zoomer by a company called Vibrant Wellness. Mm. And the Wheat Zoomer, uh, Zoomers were named Zoomers with this company before Zoom calls. Um, and it's a stupid name, but that's the name. Anyhow, they didn't ask me. Um, so the, Zo- the Wheat Zoomer looks for leaky gut markers, but it also looks for antibodies to all the components of wheat, wheat germ gluten, um, gliadin, glutenin, and the non-gluten wheat proteins. And they grade them as on a, on a red scale, a yellow scale, and a green, normal. And everybody, 100% of people with leaky gut have antibodies to the various components of wheat, 100%. Even my people who have been gluten-free for over 10 years have antibodies to gluten and wheat and wheat germ gluten. And they're shocked because they say, what the heck? I am having gluten. You know, I've been gluten-free. I'm gluten intolerant. I, I don't eat gluten. I said, I'm not saying you're eating gluten. I'm saying that because your leaky gut is such, that you've been immunized against gluten and your immune system is armed and ready in the chance that gluten sn- you know, snuck into your diet. It's ready for it. Now, what's really exciting, like yesterday, we have a patient who is about, I think, five months into this and Bright red on all these gluten markers. Um, Bright red on three of the markers for leaky gut. Now, one of the markers is green, 
The other one is still red, but about halfway to yellow. But the exciting thing is, so this person had um, a red wheat germ agglutinin antibody. It's down into the yellow now. Uh, this person had five uh, glutein and red marks. We now have one. The rest are either yellow or green. Had three um, uh, galadin antibodies. Now has one and, and so on. So they're going, oh, my gosh, you know, what's what's going on? I said, well, look, your leaky gut is less and your immune system is already getting retrained that it doesn't have to be so interested in these compounds. Mm -hmm. So when we get to nine months or a year, um, this all becomes green, everything. And they and they go, oh, boy, I can go have bread, huh? And I go, eh, not so fast. And you go, what do you mean? I don't react to this stuff anymore. There's only one thing. Our bread has glyphosate in it. Hmm. And um, it's fascinating. I have so many patients who they their autoimmune disease goes away, goes into remission. Their psoriasis, their Crohn's, their Hashimoto's, um, their MS. And they go over to, I'll just use an example, a recent patient, Italy. And what the heck, they're in Italy and they have the pasta and they have the bread and they don't react. And they go and they have the pizza and they go, ah, you know, Dr. Gundry's cured me. I can I can have this stuff, you know, wow. And they come back to the United States and they have our pizza and our bread. And a couple of weeks later, they're on the phone going. What the heck? You know, my uh, my psoriasis just flared on my elbow. What the heck? Or we'll see him in the office and their Hashimoto's markers are, you know, positive, wildly positive. And I go, what the heck have you been doing? And they go, whoa. And it's it's the crazy glyphosate in our oats, in our wheat, in our wine. It is everywhere. And is it is it it's banned in Europe, correct? Pretty much banned in Europe. That's one of the really striking um, components. Yeah, it's it, it's really and it's getting worse in Europe all the time. Although uh, Bayer, of course, now owns Monsanto, and Bayer um, is liberal with its donations to the European Union Parliament. And so there are, they're trying to get more liberal with glyphosate in Europe, but wow. I'm, I'm hoping that'll be unsuccessful. So is buying, would you say that buying or because organic promises uh, reduced exposure to these Correct. kinds of herbicides, yeah. right? But it can be more expensive. Would you say that it's worth the expense? Well, the easiest thing is just don't eat the stuff. Um there's no human need for wheat. Um, sorry about that. No, humans did very well before grains and beans were discovered. Um, that's the easiest solution. Um, that's just the easiest solution. What about beans? Are beans glyphosate? Yeah, well, so soybeans are sprayed with glyphosate. Right. Um, the... The problem with beans, and don't get me going down that road, but, uh, you know, beans uh, have uh, a high number of lectins in them. And lectins are proteins that are part of the plant defense system. Now, traditional cultures uh, have always figured out how to handle foods that they may need for calories, but that may be injurious to their health. And for instance, the Incas uh, always fermented uh, uh, quinoa before they cooked it. Uh, in Italy, where I spend a lot of time, traditionally beans are soaked at least 24 hours. And that soaking, uh, it turns out that beans, like most other substances, have bacteria on the coating of the bean. And bacteria, 
love to eat lectins. In fact, there are gluten eating bacteria that mostly don't exist in us anymore. But mm -hmm. uh, so bacteria will ferment beans. And if you've ever soaked beans, you'll notice that this kind of scum floats up to the top and it's got lots of bubbles on it. That's the fermentation of the beans. And so when you you start looking at cultures and go, you know, boy, you know, well, beans, soaking beans, that makes them more digestible. No, what they're doing is they're actually fermenting the bean and breaking down the lectins that are primarily on the outside of the bean. And you go, man, are these guys smart? You know, how'd, they, how'd they figure out how to do that? It, they obviously did better when they took those steps to do it. Now, but be like who, nobody's, at least to my knowledge, going around eating raw beans. Are are, are beans was like you know for for people on plant based diets? Not that I'm an, uh, a fan of plant based diets, but like it is a it is a uh, one of these staple protein sources for people on 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 low oh, yeah. on low meat diets. I mean, I take you know I take care of because of my experience at Loma Linda. I take care of a lot of vegans and vegetarians, and. I, you know, personally, I'm what I call a veg aquarian. Um, I eat a ton of vegetables, and my wife and I usually eat wild shellfish um, and on the weekends. And so we eat you know, a lot of vegetables. So you're but, essentially like vegan during the week? Yeah, pretty much, except, um, and I've written about this before, I'm a, I'm a big fan of um, fermented cheeses that are made from goat, sheep, or water buffalo. Right. And um, part of what's interesting about this new book is that four of the five, quote, blue zones and uh, are uh, blue zones because they're sheep herders and they're benefit of longevity comes from the fact that they eat sheep yogurt and have sheep cheese. So you're a fan of dairy and shellfish. Yeah. But why not lean protein sources? Like we know, we know the value of protein, especially as people age, like for fighting off sarcopenia for. Oh, as that's a the biggest bunch of hooey that Walter Longo and I enjoy debating all the time. Okay, you Unp do unpack not that. Eat more protein as you get older. Why? This is a very this is very controversial, and I'm not sure I agree with you. But what's your? Yeah, I'll give you the argument on why you might rethink. Okay. Two things. So the our diet, most traditional diets, are really good at damaging the wall of the gut, and there is impressive evidence, particularly in roundworms, uh, C. elegans, that death begins as soon as the wall of the gut begins to deteriorate. In fact, Hippocrates said all disease begins in the gut, and he was right. The you know, How he knew it, I'm still trying to figure out, but he was right. Uh, another way to describe that is death begins in the gut. And so as the wall of the gut becomes more and more permeable and more and more damaged, that's when inflammation that causes most of all the mischief happens. And the more intact the wall of your gut is, the longer your health span. So what I argue with Walter, who's a friend of mine, is that his observation that as we get older, we need more protein has nothing to do with we need more protein. It has to do with the wall of our gut is increasingly damaged. We normally should have a surface area of a tennis court to absorb nutrients, but that surface area is a ping pong table in a ton of my patients. And I see lots of patients with low total proteins, more particularly low albumins. Albumin is about 80% of all the protein in us 
It's egg whites. You don't have to eat egg whites to get on. We make it. I put them on a protein restricted diet that removes lectins. And shockingly, their total proteins go up and their albumins go up. In my humble opinion, proving my point that this is not a protein insufficiency in adults' diets, it's a damaged gut wall. And you repair the damaged gut wall, you absorb all the protein you need. Well, if anything, I mean, what how I would interpret what you just said is like you're removing these potentially damaging plant proteins. Correct. But there's an equally damaging animal protein that I've written about in every one of my books. And um, in the new book, it, I'm sadly going after it even harder, as the new research has shown. And you know, I got no dog in the fight. I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, you know, it's called the beef state, for, you know, for, for good reason. You know. mm -hmm you know, side of pork for breakfast, you know, half a cow for dinner. And, you know, <laughs> but there is a molecule in beef, lamb, and pork, and bison uh, called NU5GC. And NU5GC is, um, is a sialic acid that doesn't have to mean anything, but it lines uh, all the blood vessels of these animals. We had a mutation of 2 million years ago. We don't make new 5GC. We make new 5AC. They differ by one oxygen molecule. Otherwise, they're identical. New 5AC is what we use in the lining of our gut wall, in the lining of our blood vessels, in the lining of the blood-brain barrier, in the lining of our joints. And NU5AC is present in uh, chickens, uh, fowl, and fish, and shellfish. Uh, the problem with these molecules is, and feel free to Google it, folks, when we eat new 5 gc containing foods, we make antibodies to new 5 gc It is a foreign substance. And we used to think that because of molecular mimicry, new 5 ac looks a lot like new 5 gc that we attacked our own blood vessels, our own joints, because of molecular mimicry. The new evidence is so that, yes, there was an association between red meat eating and heart disease. There's an association with red meat eating and cancer and blah, blah, blah. There's a strong association with red meat eating and arthritis. Association does not imply causation. But as folks will see in the new book, uh, the causation has been established. And I wish it hadn't been. Again, I have no dog in this fight. But it is really scary uh, what we've done with these foods. Now, there is a silver lining. And the silver lining uh, comes from looking at super aged people and what they eat and how they eat these foods. And let me just say that fermentation rears its head again as how these people uh, defused new 5GC in their diet. I hope you're going to say that it, it makes dry aging steaks worth it because I love a good dry aged steak. It turns out it probably does. Interesting. Uh, probably does. But these cultures were poor. And, you know, we talk about eating nose to tail, right? Well, they would grind these things up and they would make sausages. And it turns out that curing sausages is actually curing by fermentation. And yeah, that's how they're cured. 
Okay, but what about the whole like processed meat causes? That's meat. different. <laughs> like, for instance, you know, you think our bread is actually raised by ye with yeast anymore? That we ferment our bread? Of course not. You know that nonsense. Fermentation is how all of these cultures originally made processed meats. Mm. Can't do it any other way except with fermentation. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of my good friends is uh, Chef Jimmy Schmidt, who's had, who has three James Beard Awards. So, uh, fun fact, he was the original creator of the Adkins bars, still actually makes Adkins bars. Wow. So, so he knows what he's doing in the kitchen. He knows what he's doing in the kitchen. And he makes a line of sausages. And he and I are, are very good friends. And I said, you know, Jimmy, um, I'm... I want to know how you make your sausages. Um, and he says, well, that's easy. He says, you know, we have this uh, FDA approved uh, set of bacteria that we mix in our sausage meat and it cures it. And I said, really? And he says, oh, yeah, everybody knows that, you know, you have to have bacterial fermentation to adequately, safely make sausage. And I said, and he even sent me, you know, the picture of the list of, you know, the FDA approved bacteria that you can mix in meat uh, and stuff it in a casing and you'll be legal. And I said, I said, really? And he said, oh, yeah, you know, everybody knows this. And I said, well, you know, I didn't know this. And it turns out that you can measure new 5GC in foods. In fact, we were just changing emails this morning. And traditionally prepared sausages uh, have virtually no new 5GC in them, whereas a piece of beef uh, is loaded with new 5GC. And here's the, here's the shocker. Guess what the highest new 5GC containing food there is? Start crying. Uh, uh, from beef. What cut? Oh, no. Ribeye? No. Oh, <laughs> Filet liver. mignon? Liver. Liver has got four times as much new 5GC as any other uh, cut. Wow. Wow. Well, I'm not a big liver fan, although it is a very nutrient. I mean, other than uh, the new fat. Why do the Italians use chicken livers and they don't have beef liver? Because chicken livers are new 5AC. And you go, how did these guys all get, you know, so smart? And one last fun fact, uh, the, the people with the longest uh, longevity in terms of a country, in terms of uh, lifespan, is actually a little country uh, in the mountains between Spain and France called Andorra. Hmm. And uh, Andorra has uh, the uh, longest country lifespan. It's 87.7 years. Wow. Average uh, lifespan. And these guys are sheep herders uh, and they are sausage makers. And uh, their traditional food is sheep cheese, sheep, sheep yogurt, and sausages. And they actually, and their Andorran sausages have no 5GC in them. God, I would like to live there. That's not, I mean, just to be able to eat all that stuff all day. Yeah. And well, Sheep, that, milk. You no, know, I started looking into this with the last book uh, that I wrote about Toulouse, um, where Airbus is located. That Toulouse is in the mountain, mountainous region of southern, southwestern France. And they are most famous for their foie gras and their sausages and their, um, they're really heavily sausage, foie gras based diet. They have the lowest incidence of coronary artery disease in all of France. The lowest. And it's actually because of these fermented foods. So, Dr. Gundry, correct me if, uh, if I'm misinterpreting this, but is, is sausage the new superfood? Not our sausage, except... Jimmy Schmidt's sausage, because uh, we don't prepare those things anymore. But 
When I'm uh, once I learned this, it really explains why you know charcuteries in France and Italy and Portugal and Spain have such a, a high place in these people's diets. Yeah. And you start going, you know, you know, we've been taught, oh, my gosh, you know, these people are dead people. You know, they're killing themselves and they're going to get all this cancer and blah, blah, blah. But that's not true. And it, it, how this process came about, you know, explains why these foods are not deadly to these people, but these foods are actually good for them. Yeah, I mean, it just it, it further illustrates the symbiosis that we have with with these microbes, right? Like it reminds me as you're as you're talking, it makes me think of like sourdough bread, right? The fermentation process of bread correct. reduces yeah, the I amount mean, of gluten, which is potentially a problematic protein. That's correct. And uh, and that's why back in the good old days, you know, all these processes were based on fermentation. It's the same way. It's the same way with milk. Mm -hmm. There's a fascinating study. You, you probably saw it in February. It was a study uh, out of uh, Scandinavia looking at, at people with stable angina. Now, stable angina, for our listeners, uh, is you can have blockages in your coronary arteries that are actually pretty bad. Uh, and when you exercise or walk vigorously, you get chest pain, angina, and it hurts and it gets your attention or it feels heavy on your chest. But if you slow down or stop that chest pain, that angina goes away. And then you start walking and you go to where it starts again. And that's called stable angina. And it doesn't change. And believe it or not, it's not very harmful. You can live with some pretty nasty blockages in your coronary arteries. Hmm. As long as it's stable. So it's when it becomes unstable angina or a heart attack that gets your attention. So they looked at the, the paper was basically the effect of dairy products on the outcome of stable angina. And what got the public and the news attention was the more butter people ate, the more their stable angina became unstable angina. And it was a very strong correlation. More butter, more bad outcome. The more dairy people drank, the worse their angina got. And that was the headline. Oh, my gosh, you know, butter and dairy, bad for heart disease. What was at the bottom of the paper that was barely a blip was... Gee, you know, it's interesting. The more cheese people ate, the less angina they got. And it was just a little blip that, and there's a beautiful graph. You can pull it up on the internet and it'll just blow your mind because mm. the more cheese people ate, the, the better their angina got. The more butter over the top, worse angina, the more dairy, uh, milk, uh, the worse angina, but the more cheese they ate, the better it got. And I go into that in the new book on the numerous mechanisms that that occurs. But what it gets down to is fermentation of things, in this case, dairy, in the making of cheese or yogurt, imparts all these unbelievable benefits that the microbiome is pre-digesting, if you will, getting back to our original discussion, pre-digesting compounds. It's making postbiotic compounds, taking a lot of the work away from our microbiome to produce these compounds. And that's what's you start looking at these ancient cultures and you go, son of a gun. They, you know, they worked together with this, you know, microbiome community and produced all of these health benefits that we've just you know, thrown out. I love this. So new, two new superfoods just dropped. We got cheese and sausage provided 
they're made traditionally. Exactly. And it's interesting. So aged cheeses, particularly raw aged cheeses, um, have probably the most health benefit. By the way, milk actually has new 5GC in it. That's a bad thing. But cheeses, fermented milk, yogurts, kefir cheeses, the bacteria eat that sugar molecule. They ferment it and it's gone. So, for instance, Parmesan cheese uh, has no five, no new 5GC in it. Parmesan cheese is actually among commonly consumed cheeses, excluding cottage cheese, actually has, uh, I believe, like the highest percentage of protein. Oh, yeah. Parmesan. And I mean, it gets even more fun when you actually look at how Parmesan cheese was made originally. By law, up until really a few years ago, you could only make Parmesan cheese from cows that were eating spring or fall grass. You couldn't make it in the summer or the winter uh, by law. And then, of course, Parmesan cheese got rather, rather popular. So now you can make it year round. But if you go to Italy or some Italian markets, you can actually get labeled a spring or fall Parmesan cheese uh, that was made from those cows. And the reason it was by law is that the, the difference, the health benefits um, from those cheeses are better. One last fascinating thing that was also at our big microbiome meeting, it turns out that raw cheeses have a bacteria pasteurizing the milk before you make cheese kills a lot of bacteria. But raw cheeses, there's a bacteria in raw cheeses that promotes slimness. And so the more raw cheese you eat, the more of this bacteria that you consume, and it actually populates your GI tract. Um, with, with bacteria that can help make us slim? Oh, yeah. There's a, a really cool paper out of Japan. People always wonder, well, why, you know, how come the Japanese are so skinny? There's a bacteria that uh, is capable of digesting seaweed. Uh, we're not particularly uh, Westerners don't have a lot of bacteria that can digest seaweed, but Japanese do. And several of these species of bacteria make postbiotic products that actually cut your appetite and increase your metabolism. And it's all traced back to the fact that these particular bacteria like seaweed to eat, and they in turn make these compounds. So it gets more and more and more interesting, almost in the purpose of the new book, almost everything that's going to happen to us happens from our gut, from our microbiome, from the microbiome that's eating things before it even gets to us. And the more we understand that and embrace that, the, the better we're going to do. Mm. After all, remember, we're our bacteria's home. And they would actually like to keep us around for a very long time. I love it. So, OK, what we've learned so far is that generally you want to minimize your exposure to oats, probably, um, given the, mo the modern way in which they are harvested and produced. Lots of cross-contamination over there. We've got nightshades. If you're having an autoimmune condition, you probably want to look at your nightshade consumption, particularly particularly spinach. But the foods that generally want to we want to consume more of, we've got we've got mushrooms, we've got cheese, especially raw cheese because it's got this like cool slimming bacteria that you've shared, which is so dope. We've got sausages made in the in the traditional style, the old the old world style, which uh, I'm super happy about. And can we add dry aged steaks to the list? Throw me a bone here. You know, believe it or not, uh, Jimmy Schmidt and I are actually working on that even as we speak. We we think that um, dry aging, maybe even wet aging, will will do this. Uh, how long it has to be dry aged is a good question. Uh, but he's got, I don't want to misspeak for him, but he's got samples going out to, you can actually test in the lab for 
new 5GC content and new 5AC content. And he's got some samples going out uh, even as we speak to to see. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, but we know that traditionally prepared sausages, and I we got to be clear on that. You can't go to the grocery store and buy Jimmy Dean's breakfast sausage <laughs> and say, oh, well, you know, Max and Dr. G says, you know, breakfast sausage is great for you. No, <laughs> sorry. Uh, it's got to be traditionally cured, fermented, dried sausages. And the reason for that is that this fermentation process is a form of preservation that they've been that we've been doing for millennia in these parts of the world. Mod, like if you go to your just your average supermarket and you buy you buy these like modern these sausages produced via like modern a- they're just they're dumping sodium nitrite into it and all these other preservation compounds it's not the, it's not the same food right that's, that's exactly right what why these things didn't go bad is they they utilize bacteria or yeast or both to eat all the sugar molecules that were available and it turns out that once you use those up, there's there's nothing left to go bad. Um, it's how you make wine, for instance. So you use up pretty much all the sugar and then it stops. So they use this as a way of preservation of foods that would otherwise go bad you know, very rapidly. And if you didn't have a lot to eat and, you know, that one pig you raised a year, as I mentioned, you know, for a year, one of these farmers, there's a famous quote, for a year I feed the pig, and then for a year the pig feeds me and my family. <laughs> Fair deal. So, yeah, they had to figure out a way. There were no refrigerators. There were no deep freezes. They had to figure out a way to keep this stuff, you know, viable. And so they ate up, you know, they, the bacteria ate up all the sugar molecules. And so there was nothing to rot. Fascinating. Another commonly used uh, tool to preserve food, we use vinegar a lot. I've heard you talk a bit about the health benefits of vinegar, of regularly adding vinegar to uh, one's diet. Why should people add vinegar to their diet? So speaking of pre-digested for you, um, many people who've read my last few books know I am a huge fan of short chain fatty acids. Uh, the most common that people have heard of is butyrate or butyric acid. And short chain fatty acids are probably the, uh, the most important bacterial product that can be produced for us by our microbiome. And we we could spend the next couple of days going through all why that's so, so good for you. But one of the things that's been fascinating to me in writing the new book is most butyrate producing bacteria in our gut, number one, are gone. They've been killed. But Butyrate producing bacteria need to have substrates to produce butyrate. Now, we thought that those substrates were prebiotic fiber. Um, unfortunately, that's not true. And the Sonnenbergs from Stanford, the husband and wife team, who are amazing microbiome researchers, and I, you know, I worship at their feet in terms of their ability to dissect out what's important and what's not important. Uh, The Sonnenbergs found that we could take humans and give them a high fiber diet, full of prebiotic fiber. And we can take another group of humans that we give the same high fiber diet to, but have them eat uh, fermented products. Uh, They primarily used vinegars and and yogurts. And what they found was the people who just got the high fiber diet didn't change the diversity of their microbiome. And just as an aside, the more diverse your microbiome, the better, the more species, the better. And their immune system didn't calm down. The immune system was still very highly activated. And you go, what the heck? 
In contrast, the people who got the high fiber diet with fermented foods like vinegars, like yogurts, not only got more gut diversity, but their immune system calmed down. And you go, well, you know, of course, that's what traditional cultures have always done. So then you go, well, why is that? Because quite frankly, most of these fermented foods do not have any living bacteria in them. And if there were living bacteria, the vast majority of those would be killed by your stomach acid. Hmm. So, And they will never get to where they're supposed to be in your gut. So what was going on? Well, it turns out that these butyrate-producing bacteria, if that's the holy grail, and I think it is, most of them need other short-chain fatty acids to get the job done. And those short-chain fatty acids, it turns out, acetate, acetic acid, is the number one pre-requirement for these bacteria to make butyrate. Vinegar. And so, once again, you go, son of a gun, why do these people all make vinegar? You know, why do they use vinegar in so much of their preservation and so much of their cooking? And it all comes back. They didn't know that their butyrate producing bacteria needed acetate to do it. But now, you know, that work has been done yeah. and it's it's fascinating. You, you basically have this assembly line uh, in your gut and one species produces something that the next species needs <laughs> make, you know, the third thing that you really want. But if you don't have those guys on the assembly line, the guy who's making butyrate is going, what am I going to make butyrate with? You know, you can give me all that prebiotic fiber, but you didn't give me the thing I really needed, which was uh, acetate. It's, it's like, like the, who knew? It's, it's like this crazy micro economy. Yeah. In our, in our, in in the colonic you know environment which is like so shocking and and the the, the symbiosis um that they all exhibit it's just so fascinating so when we consume vinegar it basically facilitates the pr production of these short chain fatty acids so that when we actually do consume fibrous vegetables we're able to reap maximum benefit that's the that's exactly right that's what's so amazing wow we we've missed you know, this piece of the equation. And I spent the last two books, I was praising the Sonnenbergs for the study because it, it, you know, it really, to me, started to make so much sense. And then when you sadly, like I do and you do, we go down these rabbit holes and you go, well, why was it this fermented stuff? Well, it wasn't the bacteria. It was that this assembly line was missing this other component. And yeah, you could get bacteria to make that component, but what the heck? It's already available. You know, it's pre-digested for you. And the other thing that we're learning and that I've talked about, you know, the polyphenols, these plant compounds are really good for you for multiple reasons, but... What's fascinating is polyphenols are some of the favorite food of gut bacteria. And it's probably these plant polyphenol compounds being eaten by gut bacteria that explains part of their benefit. And what's interesting in vinegars is that if you pre-digest polyphenols by wine, for instance, or vinegars, then half the job of getting the active ingredients out of polyphenols is already done. So when you consume them, you, they're already ready for action. You don't need another middleman. Wow. Yeah, and we know you've been a champion of polyphenols for... for forever. <laughs> forever. What are, do you have any, any current favorite sources of polyphenols? Uh, well, the whole last book was devoted to spices. What's fascinating is the entire spice trade was a drug trade. Mm -hmm. um, people don't risk their lives uh, for anything but drugs uh, in one way or another. And we we forget that that half the people 
in the spice trade in the Middle Ages die uh, obtaining spices from the spice islands from India, uh, either in ships or uh, in land routes. Half of them died. And, you know, why would people risk their lives to have a um, pepper on their steak? Um, it turns out that all of these spices are incredible polyphenol sources and they uncouple mitochondria, but we can talk about that another day. In fact, I, I get a kick out of the, the of the three gifts that the three wise men brought to the little baby Jesus. Uh, one of them was gold. Uh, okay, I, I get that one. But the other two were, was frankincense and myrrh. And it's like, what, you know, a gum from a tree and, you know, and a spice? You're bringing that to the little, you know, the newborn <laughs> king? Well, it turns out that these, these two things were worth their weight in gold because they were very powerful uh, uncoupling compounds. Saffron is one of the most powerful uncoupling compounds there is. And did these people know that they, oh, I need some uncoupling compounds? No, of course not. But they knew that these were these were drugs. They improved how people felt, how they lived. And, you know, they didn't buy, they didn't fight, they didn't pay all this money um, for flavor. They were after the drug effect. And now we know what effect they were. With. So, so spices are actually good for us. You're making the Kellogg brothers roll over in their graves. I hope they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, so then you can look at these old Okinawans and they go, oh yeah, these were the spice eaters of Japan. And you go, well, that's interesting. Uh, wonder why they did that. And how come they're the longest living people? Is there any truth to what the Kellogg's, uh, to their hypothesis that um, spicy foods actually have an aphrodisiac effect? Um, or, or can potentially improve libido? Because that's what they were trying I, I to shut down, a, right? Humor, a humorous story. So uh, pepper was banned at Loma Linda. You, there, there was not a pepper shaker in, in the doctor's dining room or in the cafeteria. You couldn't have pepper. Whoa. And, some of the non-Adventists uh, would would bring packets of pepper uh, and would have a pepper shaker in their locker. But the hilarious thing is that they felt that uh, chili peppers were perfectly fine, which makes absolutely no sense because if you're looking for hot uh, chili peppers, certainly fit the bill far more than uh, black pepper. Hmm. So these, you know, it's like, well, wait a minute, you can't have black pepper, but you can have all the chili peppers you want. I can have all the hot salsa I want. Uh, it's weird. Also, if I recall correctly, there was a study, they looked at the sperm quality of, uh, of seventh day Adventist men. And it's pretty, pretty low, pretty poor quality. The, the, the interesting thing about um, Loma Linda the the town of Lomelinda, which is about a you know, it's about twenty thousand people now, um, doesn't have a particularly long um, lifespan. It's actually no different than most of the United States. The Seventh Day Adventists in that community uh, do have longer lifespan, and interestingly enough. Uh, Gary Frazier, uh, who's a professor there, has been studying this for his career, says, and he's got some pretty good data to back it up, that the the vegans uh, are the longest living of the Adventists, followed by the vegetarian, the lacto-ovo vegetarians, followed by the, the chicken and fish eaters, and followed by the, well, meat eaters. Now, believe it or not, Adventists cheat um, like everybody, I guess. And so, uh, you know, I'd go to an Adventist uh, house. Most of most of my fellow professors were Adventists, and <laughs> there'd be chicken. And you know, it's like, what the heck? Uh, and all we had a Christmas party every year, and it would often be at a hotel for the department of surgery, and my longtime colleague and dear friend, Leonard Bailey, who passed away recently, um, was an Adventist. And 
So there was a buffet and we had a lot of fake meats that they were really good at making you know, mystery meats. And so he had this plate and he's sitting there munching shrimp. <laughs> and he turns to his wife and he says, you know, they are getting so good at making these fake shrimp. These taste <laughs> just like shrimp. And his wife you know, hits him, says, you idiot, you know. Oh, it's our shrimp. And he's like, oh, well, well, since I took them, I don't want to waste them. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. I mean, um, the uh, from what I recall, the Seventh Day Adventist men have their sperm quality is pretty, pretty low. And we know that like low fat vegetarian diets correlate with increased risk for low testosterone. Um, well, I can see in my patients, um, the more carbohydrates that they eat, whether they're simple sugars, whether they're carbohydrates, uh, the lower their testosterone goes. Hmm. And I'll have, you know, a number of men with low T that we, we take those foods away from them and their triglycerides, which are the first form of fat that you make from sugars and starches fall and their, their testosterone um, goes frankly, through the roof. Hmm. And they go, what the heck? You know, I've had low T, you know, for the last 10 years. And I said, yeah, it's because of what you're eating. And they, what? And I say, yeah, <laughs> is, you're being voted off the island by eating this way. You know, a lot of men, that I, ma many of my, many of my peers, actually, I don't know a single one that hasn't, hasn't had an issue with low testosterone, but my testosterone is above 1100 and I'm about to be 41. Now remember, and Total testosterone doesn't mean much. Free testosterone is what you're looking for. Yeah, it's mine. Mine's pretty. Mine is correlated. I mean, it's pretty. It's pretty high. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's it, testosterone is super important, right, Doctor Gundry? It's like for well-being, and it's not just in men. It's in it's women as well. Body composition, well-being, drive, motivation. Testosterone is like is is a very important hormone, obviously. True, but exogenous testosterone is some of the most mischievous stuff that I encounter in my practice in both men and women. Interesting. And my job is to teach a man or a woman to make their own testosterone. And the shellfish probably go a long way, at least yeah, in, help. in your diet, right? Because of the high zinc content. Yeah. I love it. Well, thanks for your time. This was super fun. I feel like we... Uh, uncovered a lot of really great stuff different from our from our previous conversations um and i'm very much looking forward to your new book hey if you like that video you need to check out this one here and i'll see you there like I, my thing always is if you're a man and you're not fasting and you want to raise testosterone you're like you're crazy what this is a free source to bring testosterone up two thousand percent increase wow in one 24-hour fast